Hi, my name is Kieran Oakland, a lecturer here at Arden University teaching psychology. Um, my interest in teaching experience is quite broad. Currently I'm teaching on introduction to biological and cognitive psychology, though I have also taught on mental health and illness and behavioural neuroscience and also research methods. Video games make us violent. Now, I wouldn't say this has been entirely debunked, um, but one of the things that's really, really exciting about psychology is that we can explore this and explore the factors that make it more likely to predispose us to aggression and violent behaviours or the things that might mitigate against violent behaviours. So for example, there's a lot of research that's quite simple that's looking at violent video games and the impact that this has upon aggressive or violent affect. So whether or not we feel as if we want to be doing something that's a little bit harmful to other people or even ourselves. But there's a wealth of evidence out there exploring how video games games can be really, really good for things like spatial awareness, decision making, forward planning um, and dexterity. Also, there's a, a, a wide raft of research looking at video games within the mental health um, sector as well. There are research um, that I read recently that explored that on child, so paediatric uh, wards in hospitals, video games could be administered in place of morphine. Um, children didn't require as much pain medication because they had video games there. And it just shows that within psychology, um, we love to say it depends. And so if you are interested in video games or you're a bit on the fence about them, it, as to whether or not they're violent or useful or good or bad, the answer is it depends. And psychology is a, an area within which we can explore how and why that is the case. <laughs> I've got one more, one more minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect, go for it. Humans are nothing like animals. Now, in many instances, this is true. You know, there are a lot of areas within our brain that really does stand as head and shoulders above the rest of the animal kingdom. But you'd be surprised at how similar a lot of our wiring and plumbing really is compared to animals. So one example I'd like to run you through that will hopefully be something you can relate to is you've gone to the cash point or an ATM to take some money out and you expect to see a certain number there, but what you see is something far lower. What will happen to your body, more often than not, is that your body will begin to mobilize resources as if you've seen a predator in the wild or some kind of a threat. It will mobilize glucose to your thighs to help you run away. It will make your pupils able to take in more light and see what's going on around you. And it will stop digestion because what's the point in digesting your lunch if you're about to become somebody else's lunch? Now, this is something that's quite amusing because we're not facing threats like that generally in the, you know, in the environment we live in. And yet our body doesn't know the difference. So if you are interested in this, feel free to give a Google of the fight or flight response because you'd be surprised at how similar we really are to the animals around us in the environment. We only use 10% of our brains. Now this is patently false. The idea being that we only use 10% of our brain. This is uh, something that's been thrown around in the research all over the place. Um, but this is false, this is actually false. If we take something as simple as looking at a tiger, so a teddy bear, the information is coming in through your eyes through something called visual transduction. It's hitting the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. It's going through various layers of processing, but we need to be able to remember and identify what we're looking at and know where it is in relation to us in space. So what that requires is various areas of our brain communicating with one another, one another at the same time. So what we need there is to identify what the object is through our memory systems, which is in our temporal lobe. Uh, we need to then remember the fact it's a teddy bear, it's not a real tiger. We also need to know where is that tiger in relation to us, and that requires areas of our parietal lobe. We might then decide we need to do something about what we've seen, and that would require elements of our frontal lobe. So as you can see, something as simple as looking at a teddy bear requires many, many areas of our brain working together to ensure that we can keep ourselves safe or reach out and cuddle the teddy bear.